وجه كبدر الليلة البلماء شمس الهدى طلعت لنا من مكة عين الندى نبعت لنا A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Ar-Rajeem Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Welcome to the third episode of this series The Golden Age of Islam wherein we will discuss the life and character of our beloved master the Holy Prophet Muhammad may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him In the previous episode we discussed about the marriage of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the blessed progeny that he was bestowed with through this noble marriage to Hazrat Khadija radhiyallahu anha in today's episode, we will look at the years of the Holy Prophet ﷺ prior to his prophethood. And joining me for today's episode in the studios is Ayaz Mahmoud Khan Sahib, who is a missionary serving in the additional regard to the Sneef department here in the UK. And joining me on Skype is Dr. Bilal Ahmed Tahir Sahib, who is an assistant professor and senior research fellow at the University of Sheffield. A very warm welcome. Assalamu alaikum to both of you gentlemen. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Ayah Sahib, referring to uh, the Holy Prophet's uh, education, the, in terms of worldly or secular education, there was no, uh, he, was, he did not have any um, formal you know, education as such. Um, but who can deny the fact that he gave us teachings that would um, you know, launch the basis of civilization? Absolutely, absolutely. The Arab society at that time um, was not a very educated society as far as secular education is concerned, uh, reading and writing and studying books is concerned. Um, they, that is not to say that they were not intelligent people. Uh, they were very intelligent people and they were blessed with a gift from God as far as their memories were concerned. Uh, so most of the history in Arabia was secured and preserved through oral traditions. The father would tell his son and he would tell his son and they would tell future generations. And this was so accurate uh, that even historians today say that that oral tradition is a very authentic source of history. So that oral tradition was present, but reading and writing was not uh, very um, widespread at that time. And what about the Holy Prophet? How was his reading? The Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam also uh, was not uh, literate in, in that sense. He was not a person who could write or read. Um, and, and that, that had a, a divine wisdom because in reality that shows that it, it seems as if Allah's hand had a part to play in that because Allah the Almighty wanted to show the world that this man who cannot read and write, Allah the Almighty will give him a, 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 a word given from God, a revelation which was the basis of, which was the Holy Quran essentially. And that Holy Quran, as you mentioned, was a basis for civilizations for all times to come. There is no insight which is not present in the Holy Quran. And who brought that revelation? Who recited that revelation to the rest of the world? A man who didn't know how to read or write. So nobody could say that he sat and thought of these words and wrote them uh, and then transferred them to other people. This was a, or, the or revelation. Or that someone else taught him that. Or that. that somebody else taught him, absolutely. And as far as the text of that Holy Quran is concerned, again, people at that time, Arabs who were, who were uh, I would say, known for their eloquence and their poetry, uh, they used to say that there is nothing as eloquent as this Holy Quran which Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is reciting to the people. So this was a miracle of Allah the Almighty. And we learned that later on in life, he did start to develop a, a recognition of certain words because treaties and documents used to be presented to him on the occasion of uh, the Treaty of Hudaybiyah when there was an objection against the use of the word uh, Rasulullah, the Messenger of Allah, when it was being written down that who this uh, treaty is being settled between. Um, an objection was made and the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam then erased that or removed those words with his own hand. So he had a certain recognition, but ultimately he was not a man who was fluent in reading and writing. So he asked, we're talking about the life of the Holy Prophet prior to his prophethood. Um, as a young man in Makkah, 
He's known as the trustworthy, the truthful. Um, everyone knows about his virtuous character, um, as we'll discuss later, that even enemies of the Holy Prophet will recognize that um, his noble character, he would never lie, he would never um, try and cheat anyone. Um, what about his close friends at that time, prior to prophethood? So the Holy Prophet وسلم, was a man who had a deeply reflective nature and he, he would remember Allah the Almighty and he enjoyed seclusion more than being in the middle of hustle and bustle and the, and the, the gatherings and the, and the spectacles that used to take place in Arab society at the time. He was removed from those things. He, so he had a limited circle of friends, but he had very good, uh, pious friends. Because of course, um, as they say, birds of the same feather flock together. So the Holy Prophet وسلم, one of his closest friends were, were Hazrat Abu Bakr. Radiallahu anhu, who um, was a man who was distinguished in Arab society for his integrity and for his qualities and for his intelligence and just for his respectable nature. And he had a very close relationship with the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then he was blessed to accept the Holy Prophet also when he claimed to be a prophet of God. Other than that, Hakim bin Hizam, we, yes. we find mention, and yes. also Zayd bin Amr, the, yes. the father of uh, Sayyid bin Zayd. And Ayaz, what about the Holy Prophet's religion before his prophethood? So uh, we, we cannot say, nobody claims that the Holy Prophet وسلم, practiced Islamic injunctions before he made his claim to prophethood. However, he was a man of pure and pious disposition. So one thing which we do know for certain is that when somebody asked him, uh, he mentioned actually himself to Hazrat Aisha once that I have never eaten from the sacrificial offerings of idols. He also mentioned that uh, when somebody asked him, Hazrat Ali radiallahu anhu narrates that, oh, Messenger of Allah, have you ever worshipped idols? And he said, no. And then somebody, the, and the next question that he asked was, oh, Messenger of Allah, have you ever consumed alcohol? And, the, and alcohol was very heavily consumed in Arab society at that time. There, there, would, there were times specified during the day when people would get together and drink alcohol. And the Prophet of Islam said that I have never drunk alcohol. I've never consumed alcohol. And then the Messenger of Allah explained that although I did not, I have always detested these things naturally. But even though I was not aware of these Islamic injunctions, uh, I did not do these things, which were then later prohibited in Islam as well. Absolutely. Uh, Bilal sahab, assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bilal sahab, we were talking about the early life of the Holy Prophet وسلم, prior to prophethood and um, as Ayas have just mentioned that he preferred seclusion, that was his uh, innate nature um, and he'd often go and worship in seclusion. Tell us about some of um, you know, where, where he would go and what would he would do in seclusion. Uh, so the most authentic account of this period and uh, what the Holy Prophet Muhammad SAW would engage in is found in uh, Sahih al-Bukhari. And in this account on the authority of Hadrat Aisha radiallahu anha, she mentions that initially the Holy Prophet Muhammad SAW would receive revelation in the form of true dreams, which would come true mithla falq subh like bright daylight. And subsequently the Holy Prophet Muhammad SAW was made to love seclusion. So he would uh, retreat into uh, the cave of Hira. Now, Hira is a mountain which is about three miles northeast of Mecca. And uh, it's uh, uh, you know, a very secluded mountain. And there the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu would climb near the summit of the mountain to enter into the cave. And he would uh, perform what has been referred to in the Ahadith as the Hanuf, which is a type of worship. We do not know the exact nature of the worship, but in his own way, he would meditate and perform religious dev devotion to remember his creator. Uh, now, it's pertinent to note is that he w w uh, loved seclusion so much so that he would climb this very intimidating mountain, as the promised Messiah Islam, said, that this is a mountain which is very intimidating that no more people would not uh, climb. Uh, but he would spend several days there. Uh, he would come with provisions that his wife, uh, Khadija radiallahu anha, would provide him with. Then when his provisions would run out, he would return back home to see his family and return back to spend more time in seclusion. And in, also uh, this in cave Hira is actually the, the first place where um, revelation uh, began. Um, tell us about that famous incident. So uh, the cave of Hira, which is located in Mount uh, Hira, uh, this mountain is popularly referred to as Jebel al-Nur, the mountain of Nur, because of 
its high significance. So uh, during the, the period of the seclusion of the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the cave of Hira, one day, perhaps after six months, as some historians have said, uh, a mysterious being appeared before him, and that was the Archangel Gabriel, alayhi salam. And the Archangel uh, spoke to him and said, Iqra, which means read or recite. And the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Ma ana bi I cannot read. Uh, which Hadrat Mirza Bashir Ahmed radiallahu anhu has interpreted to mean I cannot bear this responsibility because he understood that this means, you know, spiritually understood that this, there's a responsibility being bestowed upon him. But the angel said once more, Iqra, and uh, read. And the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi replied, Ma ana bi qari, I cannot read. And upon this, the, the angel grabbed the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and uh, squeezed him very tightly till the breath was out of him and said again, read. Again, the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, replied with the same answer until the third time when the angel uh, read, uh, 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 revealed the first uh, uh, verses of the Holy Quran, which is Iqra, read, Bismi khalaq, in the name of your Lord who created, Khalaq al insana min alaq, created a man from a clot of blood, uh, and uh, these are these are the very famous uh, verses. So uh, upon uh, receiving this revelation, the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu was frightened. And he returned home immediately. He came to his wife, Hadrat Khadija radiallahu anha, and informed her of what tr transpired. And upon inf informing her of these events, he said his famous expression, laqad khashitu ala nafsi, I fear for myself. And the, it's, it's very pertinent to note that Hadrat Khadija, being the wife of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, would know him intimately for many years. She bore his children, she knew the character. And what she, what, what her reply is, is really astonishing. Uh, she said, "Kalla, wallahi la yuxiq Allahu abada. Nay, verily, Allah would never dis uh, humiliate you ever. Uh, you know, uh, would never ever hum humiliate you." And then she cited some reasons for that: that the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would always be kind to his kith and kin. He would uh, help the destitute. He would, you know, do many acts. And for that reason, uh, Khadija was convinced that what descended upon the Holy Prophet Muhammad was, was true and from his creator. And, and, and that this is Khadija became the first um, person to profess the truthfulness of the Holy Prophet and Islam. And who did, um, uh, who else did the Holy Prophet tell after this? So uh, Khadija herself suggested to the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu that he sees his cousin, Waraqat ibn Nawfal. Now, according to the sources that we know, Waraqat ibn Nawfal was a man that had entered into the Christian faith. Uh, we do not know exactly what type of Christianity he has, but many of the medieval scholars, such as Ibn Hajar, has opined that he entered into a form of monotheistic Christianity. Regardless, he had knowledge of scriptures. And so when he heard this message, he was convinced and he said that the angel that descended upon you, O Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was the same angel that descended upon Prophet Moses, alayhi salam, as well. And then he also said something which is remarkable. He had remarkable insight because of his knowledge of the scriptures. He said that, you know, because at that point he was blind. He was an elderly man close to death. And he said that would that I was given a long life so that I could be there when your your people would turn you away and uh, show hostility towards you. And the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi said something really, really remarkable. It shows his innocence, the fact that he didn't know what events would transpire. He said, Awa mukhriji yahum. Are they going to exile me? The own, my own people that love me and that I and I also love, will they exile me? He didn't have, he had no idea of what events would transpire. But what Akutum Nofal indicated that yes, this is the case. No prophet that has come before you hasn't, you know, been the subject of hostility. Exactly. Jazakum and Bilal Sahib for that. Um, dear viewers, we are coming to that part of the show where we will go to an external panelist and get them involved in this conversation. We are talking about the early period of revelation and God forbid there is one um, uh, allegation that is also raised and it is based on the authentic traditions that um, the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, God forbid, had suicidal thoughts after he received this first revelation. Um, let us go to um, Noor Muhammad Turabli Sahib from Mauritius and see what he has to say about this. Well, this question begins with the time when the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam started to receive divine revelation, that is the revelation of the Holy Quran in the cave of Hira. The Holy Prophet ﷺ was very surprised that the, the angel, uh, well later it was known to be an angel, but at that time he was very surprised 
that uh, someone came to him, he started experiencing uh, this absolutely new thing that uh, a being came to him and started telling him to recite and recite. So after the first revelation of the Holy Quran came, the Holy Prophet ﷺ, uh, as we all know, went to his wife, Hazrat Khadija anha, and then they went to uh, Waraka bin Nafal, who consoled them and uh, explained to them that the angel who came to uh, the prophets before him came to the Holy Prophet ﷺ to bring the message from God, from Allah the Almighty. So this experience of the highest degree of uh, relation, of connection with the Divine, with Allah Ta'ala, this was the revelation of the Holy Quran. Then after this period, after experiencing, tasting this absolute uh, love of Allah, came the period of Fatrati Wahi, the period of pause, of halt in the descent of revelation of the Holy Quran. So the Holy Prophet ﷺ in that state was, a ki was kind of restless. So normally he, he became anxious that is this truly the experience, the ultimate experience that he felt with Allah Ta'ala? And since there has been a pause, so he started questioning himself. What has happened actually? Why has this being, this angel, stopped coming to him again? So in this moment, it's absolutely normal for the Holy Prophet a human being, to start questioning himself. So in this uh, question, whether he became suicidal, it's based on a hadith mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, that during this period, the Holy Prophet would climb, even climb up to uh, a, a mountains, to some heights, and contemplate on uh, you know, putting an end to his physical life. But that's the narration, the tradition that uh, was reported. But if we look at this incident itself, it's absolutely normal when we take it as a metaphor. This incident in the spiritual world, in the spiritual realm, is absolutely true. That when the Holy Prophet ﷺ started questioning himself, why has this stopped? Why has the revelation stopped? Why has this experience stopped? Is it because of my own physical human weakness? So yes, if that's the case, then I should get rid of all the human weaknesses, of all the possible mistakes, weaknesses that a human can possess. So as a metaphor, climbing to the mountain and getting uh, uh, rid of all the human weakness makes sense. And in this way, in the spiritual world, the Holy Prophet ﷺ trying to better himself so that he might taste again from the uh, descent of revelation is absolutely true. But in this case, that has nothing to do of becoming suicidal uh, in the physical world, trying to put an end to his physical life. And in this same incident, it narrated that uh, when the Holy Prophet ﷺ was coming back, uh, he saw the angel again that came to him. That means uh, he was successful in trying to get rid uh, of any kind of human uh, aspects, uh, maybe weaknesses or his own self. But he did not kill himself because the angel came to him. And when he went to his wife and he said, uh, cover me, cover me. So then the revelation of the uh, uh, Holy Quran came again, Ya Ayyuhal Muddathir. So the revelation of the Holy Quran continued from that instant and the period of Fatrati Wahi came to an end. So the Holy Prophet ﷺ at no point in his life became suicidal in the physical sense. Jazakumullah to Noor Sahib there from Mauritius and he answered a very important allegation. Hey, Al Sahib, so how did the Holy Prophet go about preaching his word? Well, as recorded in the Holy Quran, Allah the Almighty, um, this revelation is present, uh, that fasda bima tu'mar, that tell people about what Allah the Almighty has commanded you. And that was the beginning of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam then 
uh, sharing this message to the people who were closest to him. Uh, that's how the Holy Prophet began. He did not uh, initially in the first three to four years uh, very publicly um, share this message, but rather in that first three, four year period, he began with people who were around him in Mecca. And even before that, he started with his closest uh, tribesmen, the people who were part of um, the Banu Hashim. And w w there, there is an incident in which the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam arranged for a feast and invited his close relatives. And after uh, the dinner or the feast was over, uh, the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam stood up to speak. But Abu Lahab, who was a major proponent and, a, and, a, and an opponent at that time, he um, said something and then everybody dispersed. But the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was so uh, um, cognizant of this responsibility that Allah had given him that he arranged for another feast and he invited them again. And at that time then, he shared his message and he told uh, his closest relatives, uh, these people, uh, what message Allah the Almighty had given him. And then we have that incident in which Hazrat Ali radiallahu anhu uh, stood up, who was a very young child at the time, and said, I, would, I will support you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa But eventually, uh, ultimately, Abu Lahab then uh, said something in a way, by way of mockery and then everybody dispersed. And this opposition continued um, from Abu Lahab and ultimately that opposition of Abu Lahab, uh, it weakened um, the, the inter-tribal relations between the various tribes as well. He was one, um, he was the weakest link, if you will. His own tribesmen wanted to protect him, and they did protect the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam after God, of course. Uh, but that individual, him, he did not support the Prophet of Islam and encouraged other people to oppose him as well. Jazakumullah, Ya Sahib. Bilal Sahib, we had that time of history where the Holy Prophet has just started his mission, and um, he's inviting his close relatives to join the call towards Allah. Um, how did he invite his kinsmen towards this, this fold of Islam? So, Aya Sahib has very eloquently described several incidents in which the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu invited his very close uh, members of his tribe, the, uh, the Banu uh, Abdul Muttalib and the Banu Muttalib. However, the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu also invited the whole of the Quraysh. And that was after the, uh, receiving uh, the famous revelation in the Holy Quran, وَأَنذِرَ عَشِيرَتَكَ Aqrabin, which means, and warn your tribe of, of near kindred. After receiving this revelation, which was during the fourth year of the prophetic mission, the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, went on top of Mount Safa and then called the various factions and, uh, and branches of the, of the Quraysh. In, uh, so he said, Ya Bani Fihr, Ya Bani Adi, all these different tribes. He would call them and then if some of them couldn't attend, they would uh, invite a representative to see what this commotion is all about. When they all gathered, the Holy Prophet Muhammad وسلم, posed a very important question to them. He said, لو أخبرتكم أن خيلا بالوادي تريد أن تغير عليكم أكنتم مصدقية which means suppose I was to tell you that an, anim an enemy cavalry was in the valley ready to attack you would you believe me? and so just, just a note that this is very unlikely and improbable they would have known this information before the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu would have told them that but despite this they said نعم ما جربنا عليك إلا صدقا of course we do not know you except to be truthful and the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam presented this very uh, uh, implicit evidence there of his truthfulness. Uh, so uh, after that, the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as narrated in a famous hadith in Bukhari, told them about his message and the fact that he's a warner to them. And when he said that, uh, uh, the same individual that uh, Ayya Sahib referred to, which is Abu Lahab, who is, is called Abdul Uzza, he was referred to as Abu Lahab, uh, in some narrations on account of the redness of his cheeks when he became angry. Abu Lahab said to him, uh, May you perish for the rest of the day. Is this, is this the reason why you called us again ridiculing the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu So from the very early beginning of the preaching of Islam, Abu Lahab or Abdul Uzza was indeed uh, uh, a, a staunch opponent of the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu even though he was from the same tribe. It's another very famous incident that we find in the life of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu And Viewers, in case you are wondering where we are getting our information from, we are covering the life of the Holy Prophet وسلم, from the very famous book by Hazrat Mirza Bashir Ahmed radiallahu anhu, Life and Character of the Seal of the Prophets, and also um, the book by Hazrat Mirza Bashiruddin Mahmud Ahmed, the second caliph of the Ahmadi Muslim community, Life of Muhammad. So viewers, we will go to your question. As you know, this is your uh, 
program, an interactive program. And if you would like to send us questions, do send us um, your messages or emails and the information will be displayed on your screen. Let's look at today's question. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Ibrahim. I am from Rosil, Mauritius. Can you please tell us who are the first believers of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam? Jazakumullah for that question. Ayaz, very important question. Um, who were the first Muslims? And again, there's a big debate amongst scholars as well as to was it Hazrat Abu Bakr first? Was it Hazrat Ali? Was it Hazrat Zaid? Absolutely. Hazrat um, Miyam Bashir Ahmed Saib, um, radiallahu anhu, has mentioned in his book, Sirat Khatam and Nabeen, that as far as I'm concerned, uh, this is a useless discussion. A debate rather because as far as Hazrat Khadija radiallahu anha is concerned as far as Hazrat Ali radiallahu anhu are concerned as far as Hazrat Zaid bin Haritha radiallahu anhu are concerned these were all people who were part of the household of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam so a formal declaration wasn't even needed on their uh, in their respect it is assumed that they supported the Prophet of Islam sallallahu alayhi wasallam and of course they were Muslims um, other than that then uh, everybody understands and accepts for the most part that it was Hazrat Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu who was the first man to accept the Prophet of Islam sallallahu alayhi wasallam and the manner in which he accepted him is so beautiful and so inspirational that when he heard he was not in Mecca at the time he came and he asked the Prophet of Islam uh, his closest friend that have you made this claim and the Prophet of Islam wanted to explain but he said no don't ex just tell me have you made this claim and the Prophet of Islam again tried to explain because he was he was somewhat he was apprehensive. Worried, worried in case that my closest that may, friend may may have not got the right message. Yes, about it. but he said, Messenger of Allah. He said, I, I do not ask you, O Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Just tell me yes or no. And he said yes. And he said, Then I accept you, because I know you are a truthful man. And this was the level of Hazrat Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu's spirituality and, and his love. In one narration, it says that Hazrat Abu Bakr said that I don't want to, um, I didn't want to ask for a proof, so that my my iman was was that was my level of yes. iman. So it that my known. reward and my iman would not be diminished, my faith would not be. And I there don't. Are a few other notable. Yes, uh, absolutely. Who, other than that, then from Hazrat Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he he preached as well. And through Hazrat Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, Hazrat Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu accepted Islam, who became the third Khalifa, and who was the son-in-law also of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And Hazrat Abdul Rahman ibn Auf radiallahu anhu, Hazrat Saad ibn Abi Waqas radiallahu anhu, Hazrat Zubair ibn Al Awam radiallahu anhu. These were all people who uh, then Hazrat Talha ibn Abdullah radiallahu anhu. These were all people who were part of the Ashara Mubashara. The ten people who had been promised paradise in this very world through the Holy Prophet ﷺ because of their high level of faith and Iman. And of course then there were other people as well, slowly and uh, gradually this message grew and other people accepted as well. And in this um, early period of Islam, the Holy Prophet ﷺ would spend most of his time in a very famous place called Dar al -Arkum. And um, what was that, uh, the first mission or the first uh, preaching house of Islam? Yes, of course. Uh, uh, we'll leave the details to Bilal Sahib. He will speak about this. But just briefly, this had a very deep spiritual uh, center as far. This had a very uh, fundamental role to play in Islam from a spiritual standpoint. Because this was the first place in the history of Islam where the companions of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gathered. Islam is, a, is not a religion of just man and God. Of course Islam teaches a relationship between man and God, but it is a religion which teaches congregation, that people come together, they worship collectively, they spend time to collectively. And so this was that center where for the first time in history, those blessed souls flocked around the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to listen to his words. And so it has... Because of the opposition, you, they were unable to, of course, to go out. Of the course, open. they weren't able to go out in the open. Uh, but this is where they congregated and this is where they heard the blessed words of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Absolutely. Ayah Sab Jalakmullah. Bilal Sab, Assalamu Alaikum. We're discussing the uh, first center or the first preaching um, mission for Islam, uh, Darul Arkham. Uh, if I was to go to Mecca, I have a question for you. Where would I find Darul Arkham or where would it have been previously, just before we close for today's program? That's a very interesting question. So, unfortunately, you cannot see Darul Arkham now. And that is because 
uh, it's been demolished. However, historically, we can trace where it should have been. So we know that Dar al Arqam uh, was located at the uh, base of Mount Safa. And uh, Dar al Arqam, for many centuries after the death of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, وسلم, was belonging to the descendants of Al Arqam. The, the person who originally owned the house, Arqam ibn Abil Arqam. However, during the reign of uh, the Abbasid em, uh, Emperor Al Mahdi, he purchased it from the descendants of uh, Hadrat Arqam radiallahu anhu, and then subsequently bequeathed it to his wife, Khayzuran, the famous wife of, uh, who was also the mother of Harun al Rashid. Uh, throughout the centuries, different kings owned it until it was uh, transferred to the Ottoman Sultan Murad Khan. Uh, and during the onset of the 18th century, Ibrahim Beek, an Ottoman uh, who was granted permission uh, to renovate the mosque, uh, convert, uh, renovate the, the house, uh, converted it into a mosque. And it was in a very elaborate mosque with a dome. And it remained like that until the Saudi conquest of the Hijaz and the uh, establishment of the modern state of Saudi Arabia, in which it was initially converted into a Darul Hadith, into a, a place and school of teaching Hadith to students. However, in 1955, during the reign of King Abdul Aziz, uh, the, exp the famous expansion project commenced, and that was to expand the Masjid al-Haram to allow, to allow more people to visit it. And during that expansion project, project uh, unfortunately, this property and many other historical sites were destroyed. Uh, however, if you were to see where it would have been located, then you would go to uh, Bab al-Arqam. Uh, the Saudis have called this uh, Gate of al-Arqam to refer to the, uh, the, the house of Arqam radiallahu anhu. Jazakumullah Bilata for that very in-depth answer and viewers, unfortunately that's all we have time for in this episode. Jazakumullah to Yasab and Dr. Bilata for joining me today. Viewers, join us again same time next week where we will continue this journey on the golden age of Islam. Until then, Assalamu Alaikum Warahmatullahi Wabarakatuh. <laughs> وجه كبدر الليلة البلماء